Okay, so thanks everybody for tuning in. And this time we have Terry Farelli from the Institute for Theoretical Physics in Leibniz University, who is going to tell us about equilibration towards generalized Gibbs ensembles in non-interacting theories. So Terry, whenever you're ready, please take it away. Okay, hi guys. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about equilibration in non-interacting models and it's based on a paper that appeared on the archive in September but um, there's also a related paper which appeared slightly before ours by Murthy and Shrednicki and if you're interested in this kind of thing I'd also strongly recommend their paper because it's very well written and it explains a lot of the ideas quite well. Um, our, our approach was more rigorous mathematics and their approach was more kind of intuition so I think the two things complement each other nicely. Um, yeah, so something else I should say is if you want to ask me any questions, you can interrupt me whenever you want. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to hear. The audio quality seems pretty good, so I think I should be able to hear. Okay. So the basic problem we were looking at is when do isolated quantum systems reach equilibrium? Or even better, when do they thermalize? And how long does this process take? So I've kind of summarized this by this uh, schematic figure here, which on the left, you've got this picture of uh, a parameter in a Hamiltonian I've called lambda, which at time zero is suddenly changed. And this is typically called a quench in experiments. So you take some magnetic field or something like that, and then at time zero, you turn it off or, or turn it on very strongly or something like that. And this drives the system out of equilibrium very suddenly. And then one of two things can happen. So the upper arrow leading to this next figure is uh, means that the system has equilibrated and this is this will be char characterized by expectation values of physical observables spending most of their time close to some steady state so initially it's far away from the average value but then it relaxes over time and maybe there's some little fluctuations but for most times the expectation value of the physical observable stays close to its average value so that's equilibration the alternative, which was the arrow going downwards, is that it doesn't equilibrate. And this is characterized by a continuously fluctuating expectation value, which is noticeable. Um, so typically in experiments, this would be kind of signaled by oscillations of some expectation value. But in the ideal case, and what usually happens is systems equilibrate. So in that case, moving on from the equilibrated picture, two things can happen. It can thermalize, which is what the upper arrow indicates. And that means that the system relaxes so that the density matrix is a thermal state. It's this Gibbs state here, which is e minus beta H normalized by the trace. So this is kind of the holy grail of this uh, foundations of statistical physics program is to show that quantum systems equilibrate to a thermal state. Um, but this, sometimes this actually doesn't happen, and that's what the arrow going downward indicates. And when this doesn't happen, this is usually because there's some conserved quantity that we can measure. So for example, this happens in many-body localization, where there's some local observable that we can measure, which uh, encodes information that isn't really scrambled by the dynamics of the system. So the system has some memory, and it doesn't relax to, an equi to a Gibbs state. And GGEs, so generalized Gibbs ensembles, are another case where there's some conserved quantity which rules out thermalization. And then another interesting question, which I've written at the bottom there, is how long does this process take? Yeah? Excuse me, uh, I have a, just, just a basic uh, question just, just to check uh, this slide. Um, so when you say the system thermalizes, you, you mean a part of the system, so the total system is, is, is a pure state, but any any part of the system looks like a thermal state of the same Hamiltonian. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So, so I'm thinking typically of we do some measurement on some small region, like a few spins, and locally it looks like a thermal state. But yeah, of course, obviously globally it could be in a pure state, which obviously wouldn't look thermal. Right. And uh, is there some intuition as to why having conserved qualities interferes with thermalization? What do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, if the if you've got some local conserved quantity, then like suppose it's uh, it's just got two eigenvalues like plus and minus one, then I could initialize the, the system to have to correspond to the plus eigenvalue, or I could initialize it to correspond to the minus eigenvalue, 
And because it's a conserved quantity, as the system evolves over time, this, this value will stay at plus one or minus one. So the system can't thermalize. Oh, right. It remembers this information. So if the system thermalizes, it always goes to this Gibbs state. But if it remembers something like two different choices you made at the start, in both cases, it can't be equal to the Gibbs state. You see what I mean? Right, right, right. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, so yeah, so these are really fundamental questions. They're really important for statistical physics. And it's a relatively big field now. And there's lots of different approaches people use to try and understand this kind of thing. So one thing you can do, obviously, is you can do numerics. And usually people use exact diagonalization for this, which is, it's very good for intuition and stuff, but it's really only limited to small systems because there's only so many qubits we can handle on our computers, like maybe 20 or so, or maybe less even. Um, and people have also done some really cool experiments recently with ultra cold atoms, where they indeed see that systems thermalize or in very special cases, they see some some non-equilibrium behavior and stuff. And this also helps to uh, give us some understanding of uh, thermalizing versus non-thermalizing or many body localized systems. And then obviously the thing we're interested in here is theory. So how can we understand this all theoretically? And over the past couple of years, people have done this for very abstract <coughs> quantum systems. So they just start with the absolute bare minimum. minimum. You say, okay, I've got some Hilbert space. There's some observable I'm interested in. There's some initial state and there's some Hamiltonian and they try to make as few assumptions as they possibly can and prove and see if they can prove whether or not the system will reach equilibrium and it turns out this actually works a lot of the time but the only thing is you don't get any information about the time scale I mean you can get some estimates for the time scale but it's usually exponentially large in the system size which is totally unphysical okay so approaches to get around this and actually find out something about the time scale. There's a couple of different things you could do. So one uh, that's fairly popular is you can use some kind of randomness. So you could say, okay, what if I assume that the Hamiltonians are random and then I average over all Hamiltonians? And this actually works well in some cases. So you can get uh, estimates for the time scale for equilibration for systems from this, but in some settings it's really unphysical. Maybe in most settings it's really unphysical because if you're randoming with if you're doing this randoming procedure with some higher random unitary, then it scrambles all the locality of your system. So if your initial state was something like the first state here with these arrows, these spins, if half of the system on the left was spin up and half of the system on the right was spin down, then we'd expect the equilibration time scale to scale like the size of the system, roughly, because it would take time for information to propagate along the, the spin chain. But with these uh, higher random methods, you don't see this at all. So it doesn't, it misses this kind of information. But it works okay for systems where there's no large scale structure like this and, and really things equilibrate quickly locally by kind of averaging out. Um, another approach and what we're gonna look at here is instead of averaging over Hamil Hamiltonians, you can restrict your focus to some really specific set of Hamiltonians and observables. So in our case, we'll look at quadratic Hamiltonians and local observables, and then initial states that have some decaying correlations, and they also don't have this large scale structure property. So they aren't like one half of the system is spin up and one half of the system is spin down, for example. Okay, so our setting is fermions on a line um, with periodic boundary conditions, so a ring. And it's discrete space. And we've got creation and annihilation operators that we denote by A. And these obey the usual anti-commutation relations. And then we've got observables, which are sums of even products of creation and annihilation operators. And they're also local. So for example, you could measure the number of fermions at one site, or you could measure uh, the second observable here, which is just correlations between site M and site M plus two. And a useful tool for studying these systems will be the covariance matrix, which is written here. So it's the expectation value in the state uh, in terms of this operator, AN dagger AM plus AM dagger AN. And for technical reasons to make our lives easier, we assume that this 
this latter expression vanishes. So the expectation of a n dagger a m dagger plus a n a m vanishes. We can deal with this stuff, but then we have to work with Majorana fermion operators and things become a little more tricky. Okay, so I mentioned that we need this assumption on the initial state, and this is exponential decay of correlations. And how this works is basically the given by the formula here. So we look at the correlation function between the expectation of A and B in the state. And this is bounded above by something that essentially decays exponentially with Xi, which is the correlation length. So here, uh, the parallel lines are just the operator norm. SA is the, the support of an operator. So the, the, uh, the size of the region of the lattice on which the operator is localized. And then D is just the distance between supports of operators. So if they're really far away, then this, this is very small because it decays exponentially. But if they're close, if the distance between them is small compared to the correlation length, then, then uh, this might be quite big. Okay, so the dynamics we consider is, it's a, like I said, it's a quadratic Hamiltonian. It's a local quadratic Hamiltonian. So there's some hopping between, of fermions between different sites, but it's local, there's some finite range. And we also assume that it's translationally invariant. And because it's translationally invariant, we can do a Fourier transform to uh, get the dispersion relation. So E of P in terms of the lattice momentum, which is P. Okay, so this gives us the simpler formula for the Hamiltonian here. Also in terms of the momentum creation and annihilation operators. And because we've assumed it's finite range and it's translation invariant, the, in the last equation there, the dispersion relation is just a, a sum of cosines with some real coefficients. Um, more generally, it would be a sum of cosines and sines, but uh, it just makes the math a little bit easier if we just look at the case where there are cosines. Okay, so it's useful to keep a simple, in a simple example in mind of all this. So just take the simplest hopping Hamiltonian, the nearest neighbor hopping, Ham hopping Hamiltonian. Uh, if we Fourier transform that, we get the dispersion relation, which is just E of P is equal to two times cosine P. So it's just two times the cosine, which is, uh, which I attempted to depict in the picture there. And it'll be useful to keep this example in mind for the rest of the um, ideas that come on because it helps you understand a lot of what we do. Okay, so key here will be the propagator. And this is, we denote this by W sub NM. And you can write this in terms of this H matrix that we had before, where this small H was just the, the uh, hopping coefficients in the Hamiltonian. So you can write the propagator in this form. And then in the Heisenberg picture, the uh, annihilation operators evolve in a very simple way. They just, you just multiply them by this um, propagator matrix. And this also means that the covariance matrix gamma um, evolves in a very simple form as well, because we can just factor out these W matrices. Okay. Right. So, so, so a question. Yep. Uh, this 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 matrix W is um, is a rotation matrix or what 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 group it forms? Oh, uh, let me think. It's unitary. It's uh, it's yeah. It's unitary. Um, I don't think it necessarily has determinant one or anything, but it's definitely unitary. Um, and the reason it you can see that the reason it has to be unitary from the second equation there is because, okay, well, it takes a bit of work, but to preserve the anti-commutation relations, you can show that if a n of t obeys the same anti-commutation relations as a n, then w has to be a, a unitary matrix. But obviously you can also see this from the equation above because it's written as e to the minus i h t, and this little h has to be self-adjoined. Okay, very good, thanks, yeah, agreed. Yeah, um, so yeah, so actually in the Majorana case, you have a similar construction, except the, 
the matrix you get, the propagator has to be a rotation matrix. It has to be real. But, uh, but a lot of the same ideas apply in that case. It's just um, a little bit more awkward because you have to work with Majorana. Okay, so the first part of proving equilibration is showing that these propagators decay as a function of time. So the, the goal is to prove this top equation we've got here, which is that the absolute value of the propagator matrix uh, decays with some power of t, where alpha is some positive number. Okay, and so to do this, it helps to write the, the propagator matrix in this form. So this, this ket and bra here, this n and m, these are, uh, you can think of these as single particle vectors, basically. Um, and if we switch to momentum space, which we do in the line below, then we can just work with the dispersion relation, this E of P, and this simplifies, um, well, it doesn't simplify, but it makes the problem tractable later, so that we get this final expression for the propagator matrix, which is now in terms of the momenta P. And it also depends on the M minus N, which is the distance between the sites looked at in the propagator. Okay. And so our goal is to bend the absolute value of this thing here. And on the face of it, it's not so obvious how to do this. There's a couple of things you could do. Um, the approach we use is to use something called the Kuzmin Landau bend. Um, you could also do something like uh, stationary phase or something like that. But I like this Kuzmin Landau bend approach because it's, it's a new tool that I hadn't seen before. And I think it's kind of good to use it because maybe it'd be useful for something else as well. And it's kind of a, a neat little formula. Okay, so how this works is we've got some real numbers, phi of n, where n takes values between zero and big N minus one. And actually the bound doesn't depend on the size of big N, which is nice. But what you do is we assume that the gaps between these phi Ns, so delta N, which is phi N minus phi N minus one, we assume that all these gaps are either all increasing or they're all decreasing, i.e. delta N will be greater than or equal to delta N minus one. And so if this is true, and if all the gaps are between some lambda and two pi minus lambda, so for example, lambda could be something small like 0 0.1. If this is true for all n, then the absolute value of the sum of e to the i phi n is essentially bounded above by one over the smallest gap, this lambda. So you can imagine that this, uh, this sum over n here, this, is, this could be like the, the sum that we have in the propagator, and this is exactly how we're going to use this bend. Okay. So let's apply this to the propagator. Um, to make our lives easier, let's assume that n equals m. The, the more general case where n is not equal to m is a, a little bit more tricky, but it's basically the same idea. Okay, so the, the phi's that we had in the last place, the, for the propagator, these are going to be E of P times T. And I just put the subscript K on the P there to indicate that these are um, the lattice momenta and these take values two pi K over N, where N is the number of sides. Okay, you can also see here that the, this phi depends on T and so there's the gap on the line below. So the, the size of the gaps depends on T. And so the gap is E of PK minus E of PK minus one. Okay, so there was an assumption in the Kuzmin Landa bound, which was that the gaps all either have to be increasing or they all either have to be decreasing. And if you look at the plot of the dispersion relation in the bottom left corner for the, the the cosine example that we had before, the simple example, then you can see that the gaps can't be all increasing or all decreasing everywhere because there's turning points in the dispersion relation. So for example, I've marked some regions here. If you look at say region two, uh, 
then you can see that as you go from smaller p to higher p, the gaps get smaller, the energy gaps. And if you look at region three, the gaps get bigger because as you go to higher p, the, the, uh, the gradient of the curve, the derivative of the curve is bigger. So the trick here is to break this sum in the propagator uh, is to break it up into four different regions by using the triangle inequality. So in each of these regions, in, in say R1, all the gaps are increasing in size. So within this window, we can use the Kuzman Lander bound, and that's why we use the triangle inequality to, uh, to split the sum up into these, the sum over these four different regions. Obviously, if the dispersion relation is something else, not cosine, it might have more turning points and there'd be more regions. But you can prove that for local hopping models, the number of regions is finite and is bounded by, I think it's four times the hopping length. Okay, so let's look at R3 as an example more closely. So you can see on the x-axis, on the p-axis, the, the little lines, the little notches on the axis mark the different values of momenta. And because the derivative at the top of the dispersion relation, so for small p, the derivative is very small, so the energy gaps are very small. And remember that the kuzmin landau bound goes roughly like one over the smallest gap. So these small gaps mean we're going to get a pretty bad bound. So the trick here is to say, well, we've got some very small gaps in some window, say between zero and delta. Let's use the triangle inequality trick to just take these guys out of the sum. So this is what's done in the very bottom line. We've got this, the original sum we want to bound, the sum over all momenta in P3. And we use the triangle inequality to take out the, the terms that correspond to very small gaps. And you can figure out how many terms there are. It's basically delta divided by the width between different momenta. So this corresponds to delta times L over two pi. Okay, so we've got this term, which corresponds to the very bad gaps. And then we've got the rest, which should be a sum over momenta corresponding to big gaps. Okay, so how do we bound this? Well, we need to find out what the smallest gap is in the remaining interval. And so this is pretty straightforward to estimate. If you look at the figure on the left, sorry, it's a bit small, but if you look at the figure on the left, so here we have delta and the, the smallest gap corresponds to the two smallest values of momenta left in this remaining interval. So this corresponds to E of delta plus two pi over L minus E of delta. So this is the smallest, um, the smallest gap and we can estimate this by the derivative of the dispersion relation to first order. And so you get, it depends on the dispersion relation, but for this cosine example, you get that the, the derivative is approximately delta, which is worked out over here on the right. So if we differentiate two cos p, we get minus sine p. So we get that for a small delta, this goes roughly like delta. So this gives us an estimate of the smallest gap left in the so-called good interval, in the interval of not so small energy gaps. But obviously for different dispersion relations, you can have um, the derivative of E at delta be something other than just delta, it could be delta squared or delta cubed or something like that. Um, and this is something you have to be careful about. And this is one of the most tricky technical things in this result is just dealing with all the different possibilities. Um, but the intuition is pretty straightforward, at least for this useful example. Okay, so we have an estimate for the smallest gap in this remaining window. And then if we plug this into our bound using the kuzmin landau bound for the last term on the right in this big equation, then the, the result of the kuzmin landau bound was that the, the sum goes like two pi over the smallest gap. The smallest gap we've estimated, it was delta two pi over L times T. And so if we plug all that in, we get this very simple thing at the end, which is just delta over two pi plus one over delta times T. Okay. And then delta is arbitrary. We haven't actually decided how big or how small to pick delta. So the trick now is to pick it to 
gets smaller with t. And so if you pick delta to go like t to the minus one third, then this whole thing at the end goes like t to the minus one third. So, okay. so a question, should, should we worry that, uh, I mean, the delta is going to affect like this, this decay, uh, depending on what we pick, we're going to get very different results? Or in the end, like this, this particular precise scaling is not going to matter? Uh, you mean the choice of delta? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, okay, well, so it, it depends on a bit on what the, the estimate for the smallest gap was. So for this example, it just goes like delta. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, you'll get different scaling depending on what you pick for delta. So like you could pick delta to be t to the minus one quarter or something like that, and you'd get different decay. Um, in this case, delta as t to the minus one third, I think is optimal, but you can check. But uh, it definitely doesn't cause a, a problem. Actually, I'm not sure if I've, I've answered your question properly. But, um, mm. well, let, let, let's see how, how it propagates forward. Okay, yeah, okay. And yeah, maybe, we'll come, maybe come back to it and I'll be able to answer it better later. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, right, so using this, we get this bound at the top equation here, which is that the absolute value of the propagator decays like some constant times t to the power of minus one third. And this is the result we were looking for. You can also use a similar argument, which is a bit more convoluted to show that the, uh, the covariance matrix decays to its time average value. So on the left-hand side in this equation with the covariance matrix, we've got the absolute value of the difference between the covariance matrix at time t and the time average covariance matrix. And so you can show using a similar argument this, that this decays like t to the power of minus alpha for alpha some real number. This is, um, this is a little bit more tricky because the, the gaps in the Kuzmin bound in this case aren't gaps between energy levels, but they're actually gaps between gaps of energy levels, which is a bit painful. And you also have to, this is where the assumption that the initial state doesn't have a large scale structure comes in. It's not obvious from what I've, I've written here, but you need to assume that the initial state is something like an M-step periodic state. So an M-step periodic state would be any state, which when you translate it by M sites is the same state again. So we need an assumption like this to derive this formula. But the, the basic idea goes along the same lines as the formula for the decay of propagators. Okay. Um, okay, so we saw how, how to show the propagators decay, and we saw that the covariance matrix in a similar way relaxes to its time average value, but the covariance matrix only tells us something about quadratic observables. What about higher order observables? So we can show that these uh, equilibrate two and the way that we do this is by showing that the system relaxes to a Gaussian state. So at the top here, if we have a Gaussian state, we could just use Wick's theorem, right? Which allows us to express high order, um, uh, high order observables in terms of the covariance matrix. So in terms of quadratic observables, which is what this, the second part of the equation is showing. And this is really useful because we know that the system's covariance matrix relaxes in time to some constant value. But the problem here is that the state we have isn't necessarily Gaussian, so we might not be able to use this. The trick now is to show that the system relaxes to a Gaussian state, and then we can use this formula. So how to do this is we look at the connected correlation functions. So here I've denoted connected correlation functions with this double angle bracket. And this is given, for example, for a four point connected correlation function. And the single angle brackets here denote expectation values in the state. So this is an example of a connected correlation function. And we know that if all the connected cor correlation functions are zero, then the state has to be Gaussian. And then everything can be expressed in terms of the covariance matrix. So our goal is to show that these connected correlation functions vanish in time. 
Okay, so this top equation might be a bit hard to read, um, but consider the four point connected correlation function at time t. We can expand this. Remember these uh, creation and annihilation operators are in the Heisenberg picture. So we can expand this in terms of the uh, propagators. And we get this sum here. And these mi's are. So, so, uh, of, a, hmm? a quick, a quick question. A quick question, actually, here. So, yeah. so you're you're assuming that the Hamiltonian is 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 quadratic, but you're saying that the initial state does not need to be Gaussian, and that's why you look at the decay of higher point correlation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Exactly. Um, yeah. And so we expand the connected correlation function like this. I've just noticed there's some stars missing. So on the on the second two w's, these should be w stars. Okay, and the assumption of exponential decay of correlations comes in again here. So because of exponential decay of correlations, we know that the connected correlation function between these four sites, m1 to m4, will be very small if any of the distances between, say, m2 and m3 or m m1 and m4 is much bigger than the correlation length. This is essentially the assumption in exponentially decaying correlations. So this will play, play a role in a second. Now, if we look at this figure in the bottom left-hand corner, we have these, these four sites N1 to N4 in the top line. And if you look at the backwards Lee Robinson cone to see which operators contribute significantly to this uh, expression at the very top in the expansion of, these, of this connected correlation function, then the number of sites that matter is essentially proportional to t because there's a, a Lee Robinson bound for the systems, so information propagates at most with some constant velocity. And so this means only, only vt, say, where v is some, some Lee Robinson velocity, only vt sites matter in the expansion at the top of this connected correlation function. Furthermore, each mi in the sum has to be within the correlation length of the other mi's. So because of this, only psi to the power of three times t terms contribute non-negligibly to the expansion we have at the top of the page. Because anything that doesn't satisfy these conditions is very small. Okay. So also, we proved uh, a few slides ago that the propagator decays like t to the power of minus a third. So we can also plug this into the expansion we had. Maybe let me go back for a second. We can also plug this into the expansion we had for the connected correlation function, which is here at the top. So we can plug in this bound for these w's. And we get that the, the absolute value of the connected correlation function um, can be bounded above by something that depends on time. And in fact, it decays and it decays as a function of time, like t to the power of minus one third. And so because the connected correlation functions decay in time, that means the state relaxes to be Gaussian. Because after some time, these are all very small. And so essentially the covariance matrix determines everything. Okay, um, right, so the state, is, the state relaxes to be Gaussian, which means that everything can be expressed in terms of the covariance matrix, but we already saw that the covariance matrix after some time relaxes to its time average, which means that the state must relax to its time average. So that means that if we wait some time, and there's a power law decay for this as we saw, it's t to the minus one third in the cases we looked at, um, if we, if we wait a short amount of time, then the state relaxes to a Gaussian equilibrium state. Although, as, as we discussed earlier, this is only true locally. So this is only true for local observables. And this is great, but it isn't necessarily true that the equilibrium state be thermal. So we only know that it's a Gaussian state, but it's not necessarily true that it's e to the minus beta h. For example, there's an equation at the bottom here where we have 
the most general form of the equilibrium state, where these beta n's are sometimes called generalized temperatures. H is the Hamiltonian, beta zero would be the, the normal temperature. But then we've also got these i n's, which are other conserved quantities. So this is the formula for a generalized Gibbs ensemble. And if these beta n's are non-negligible, then the density matrix isn't a thermal state, it's only a generalized Gibbs state. So this doesn't prove thermalization, but it does prove relaxation to some generalized Gibbs ensemble. Okay, right. I just realized that was actually pretty fast. Um, so yeah, maybe let me just point out some future work. So something really interesting would be to look at weak interactions, maybe perturbatively to see if local weak interactions don't kind of rule out relaxation to a Gibbs state, or if they do, if you can figure out the time scale, like maybe there's a time scale at which you quickly relax to a generalized Gibbs state, and then over a longer period of time relax to a thermal state. That would be very interesting. Um, something else that would be really nice would be non-translation invariant systems. So the calculations we did here, it was crucial that the, that the Hamiltonian was translation invariant because the Fourier transform allowed us to make everything pretty simple. Um, physically, obviously, there's perturbations which would break translational symmetry, or you might even want to look at models which are deliberately translation non-invariant. And then it's an interesting question to ask whether you can also find similar bounds on the equilibration time scale. You might not get a, a GGE at the end, you might, you might even get thermalization, but it's an interesting question to ask whether you can say how quickly this happens. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, are there any questions? I have one. So yeah, thanks for the very nice talk. Could you remind us um, where did the uh, exponent of one third come from? Oh yeah. Uh, let me go back. It came from the estimate of the gap here. So, right, so we, had this, we had this estimate for the gap that's kind of in the middle, delta two pi over L. And then we plug this into the formula at the bottom using the, the kuzmin landau bound to get this little formula at the end with the delta over two pi plus one over delta t. And uh, actually I've noticed there's a small mistake here. So, so here we can pick delta to be whatever we want. And we want to pick it to be something that uh, gives us a bound that decays in time. So because of the term on the left, delta should become smaller with time. But it shouldn't become small too quickly because of the term on the right. And that's why I picked delta to be t to the minus one third. I think for this specific formula, the optimal choice would be t to the power of minus one half. But yeah, what choice you pick really depends on what expression you get at the end. So for example, the gap could go like delta squared, and then you would get a different estimate. Then in the case where it's delta squared, I think t to the minus one third is optimal. But it, it depends on the dispersion relation. Oh, OK. Very nice. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So in, in summary, what is your most uh, general statement about the time scale of the thermalization? Um, uh, I didn't really. Uh, yeah. Edit. Right. Okay. Uh, the most general statement is that the for these models, for translation invariant fermion models in one dimension, um, with exponentially decaying correlations. And, and this assumption that there's no uh, large scale structure, the system will relax to a generalized Gibbs ensemble in a time scale that's, uh, well, it relaxes with power law decay. So t to the power of minus alpha, where alpha is some real number. So in, for the examples we gave, it was minus one third. But it depends a bit on the dispersion, on the dispersion relation. It could be a bit slower, or a bit faster, maybe t to the minus one half or t to the minus one quarter. But that's the basic results. I see. Thank you. Uh, and did you try to compare uh, this result with some exact uh, or like semi-exact uh, calculation? Um, yeah. In a so sense, we... if in the physical, if in a physical system the decay is maybe you know it's like uh, it's what it's like the it can decay like t to minus one third or faster, right? Yeah, so I think 
the I think we think that the fastest decay for these kind of models should be t to the minus one half. And this intuition is partly based off some numerics. I, I don't think we put the numerics. I don't think they're in the paper. But um, we had some numerics that convinced us that t to the minus one half should be the fastest you could get for these specific models. Obviously, non-quadratic Hamiltonians could decay faster, could have faster equilibration. But we think, we think t to the minus one half is the fastest. Did I answer the question there? Or did I miss something? Yeah, I think, I think so, yeah. OK, cool. Are there any more? more? Oh, sure. Yeah, I have one more question. Like, uh, can, you, can you tell us like, in a few words like, uh, what's like, uh, common and what's the difference between this, this other paper that you mentioned that you're roughly speaking at the same time on the archive? Oh, yeah. Um, so our approach was like we were very concerned about the deltas and epsilon, so the, the mass is pretty rigorous. Um, and we use this Kuzmin Landau trick and their approach was they use stationary phase methods and it's It's not so rigorous. I mean they they don't claim it is like they're they're more interested in physical intuition. So I'd say Yeah, I guess that's the main difference. Also If I remember correctly in their paper, they They prove stuff for bosons and fermions in our paper We just prove stuff for fermions and say that it extends to bosons, but we we didn't show it. I mean, it is true and it's not so difficult, but we didn't actually write anything explicit. But are your bounds the same actually, or? Um, they differ. They're more or less the same. Uh, I'm not sure about any constants in front, but it's all the same in terms of like power law decay in this way. But actually, I'm not so sure about whether the constants in front are different. I haven't checked that. Okay. Well, thanks. Well, if there are not any more questions, then let's thank uh, Terry again. Cool. Thanks a lot, guys. This was kind of fun. <laughs> thanks, Terry. Thanks for the for a nice talk. <laughs>